You are listening to The Bridge Busters, The First Ambusters and The Race to Save Britain, written by Mark Felton, published by Mandalay Books, and narrated by Mark Felton. Chapter 11. Making the Cut Look here, Harris, Air Marshal Charles Portal said during a telephone call in early August from his Southdown HQ. I think we have to face facts. Our current strategy for dealing with the aqueducts is simply not producing good enough results. Bomber Harris could only concur. After all, both structures were still standing. I know your boys have managed to damage M25A and a section of the canal bank, but it's not enough, Portal continued, his tone exasperated and tetchy. I have received another invasion warning from the Air Ministry concerning a possible German landing between the 5th and the 9th of August. Apparently the tides and sea conditions during that period are perfect. So, I must impress upon you the absolute necessity of destroying the aqueducts to slow down or indeed curtail the further movement of barges to the channel ports. I need results, Harris, and fast. Harris was inclined to agree with Portal's summation of the situation. The results thus far were disappointing, and with every passing day, the likelihood of a German crossing of the channel was growing. Oh well, sir, Harris said, shifting uncomfortably in his chair as he held the black Baker-like receiver to his ear. The problem, as I see it, is hitting the aqueducts accurately with the M-bombs. I think it's down to training. We are simply ordering this or that squadron to attack the targets without adequate preparation. Then what do you suggest? Portal replied. We select and train a group of crews to assault the aqueducts from among the best in my group. Put them through an intensive practice course until they can hit a similar target accurately every time. Hmm. How many crews? Portal asked, interested. I'd say about a dozen, sir. They need to be taken off ops for at least a fortnight to concentrate only on this mission. Who are your best squadrons? Uh, 49 and 83 at Scampton, sir. We could take the best crews from each and form a joint attack force, Harris replied. Portal thought for a moment. All right, see it gets done, Portal said. But remember, Harris, this operation is top priority. I want it seen through as soon as possible. Yes, sir, you can rely on my boys. Harris replaced the receiver in its cradle, thought for a moment, and then pressed the intercom buzzer to his assistant outside. Get on to Scampton at once. Have the station commander and the COs of 49 and 83 squadrons report to me in person on a matter of the utmost importance. Harris leaned back in his chair and lit a camel. I want a list of the best half-dozen crews from each of your squadrons, Harris explained to Wing Commanders Gillen and Sisson when they arrived for the meeting, accompanied by Group Captain Hugh Wormsley, who commanded Scampton. The pair of squadron commanders were surprised and somewhat intrigued. What's the job, sir? Gillen asked. It's those infernal aqueducts over the Ems, I'm afraid, Harris replied. We're going to try a new scheme to knock them down. As you know, Hemswell has had some partial success against them. But the fact remains that both aqueducts are still operational. Harris stood and walked over to a large wall map of western Germany. The problem is accuracy. So this time, we are going to train a special unit to make sure that these aqueducts are well and truly smashed. Gillen and Sisson could immediately see the logic behind Harris' decision. So, the crews you select for training must be your best night flyers with excellent bombing records, Harris continued. The scheme is for everyone to go through an intensive training course. They will practice bombing canals in Lincolnshire, and you will score each crew for accuracy. At the conclusion of the training period, I want you to select the five crews with the highest scores to form the assault group. The others will be a sort of second eleven, and will carry out a diversion while the assault group attacks the aqueducts. Clear? Yes, sir, Gillen and Sisson replied together. Now, according to the Met Man, the best moon conditions for such an operation will occur on the night of the 12th of August. Your assault and diversion forces must be ready for an operation on that date. I will brook no delays or postponements. Is that clear also, gentlemen? 
though their state was beyond that highlighted by Portal as a possible window for a German invasion, Harris could only hope that Hitler's preparations would not be completed in time, buying Five Group a final chance to have a crack at the aqueducts. Gillen and Sisson replied in the affirmative. They had less than two weeks to hone the selected crews into a coordinated and well-trained attack force. It would be quite a challenge, but it was clear from Harris's tone that he was under pressure to deliver a result regarding the aqueducts. To take 12 experienced crews, totaling 48 men, off operations for a fortnight, while every squadron Harris possessed was bombing barges and communication centres flat out, was a serious diversion of forces that Britain could ill afford. But it demonstrated the overriding importance of the twin aqueducts in British plans to halt Hitler's invasion. There was a feeling that it was now or never concerning the Dortmund-Ems Canal. Gillen and Sisson understood perfectly what was at stake. The very survival of Britain as an independent nation was being threatened. Harris's plan represented a last throw of the dice for Bomber Command. The next day, the crew selected by Gillen and Sisson received orders to report to the briefing room for a special meeting. The officers and airmen crowded the room, chatting and smoking, nobody knowing why on earth they should have been selected. They were the best of the litter, so to speak, the men who'd proved themselves not only the most accurate bombers, but also the ones with the best luck. Many had reputations as daredevils, the very push-on types that were required for such a dangerous mission. In the event, it wasn't quite a neat half-dozen from each squadron who were selected. Number 49 Squadron had five crews in the mix, led by squadron leader Lowe, who sat with his navigator, Sergeant Joseph Unsworth. The young 25-year-old sergeant had posted into the squadron in June 1940 and had already been awarded the Distinguished Flying Medal for Gallantry. So also had Sergeant Appleton, Lowe's ventral gunner, who'd been awarded the medal in July. Flight Lieutenant Babe Leroyd was, as usual with his navigator and close friend, Pilot Officer John Lewis, an old sweat at age 20, who'd been with the squadron since 1938. Leroyd's two gunners, Sergeant Willis and leading aircraftman Rich, took up the next two seats. Rich, a short man with wavy black hair, rubbed his chin reflectively as he waited for the briefing to begin. Next to him was Flying Officer Drakes, his chess-playing navigator, Sergeant Harold Boyd, and Drakes' two gunners. Flying Officer Riley chatted to Sergeant Simpson, his wireless operator, while the last pilot from 49 selected for the mission, Pilot Officer Hugh Matthews, 22, chatted to his more experienced navigator, Sergeant Charles Fennell, who'd been with the squadron a year longer, along with wireless operator Sergeant John Gadsby, a 21-year-old farmer's son from Nottinghamshire who'd originally joined the RAF in 1937. Though a relative newcomer to 49, Sergeant Fennell, originally from County Down in Northern Ireland, had already served 13 years in the RAF. He had survived a serious prang in mid-May when his Hamden had lost its starboard engine and crashed on the French coast at Ault. The only sergeant pilot among the crews selected, Walter Haskell, had been with the squadron since February. His ventral gunner, aircraftman First Class Briggs, had only posted in a month earlier. Occupying the chairs on the other side of the aisle from the 49 personnel were seven crews from 83, led by squadron leader Joe Collier. The rest of Collier's crew, Sergeants Stubbing, Johnson and Threlfall, chatted quietly among themselves, while Collier passed the time with his great friend, Flight Lieutenant Jamie Pitcairn Hill, and his navigator, Flying Officer Harrison. The irrepressible Guy Gibson sucked reflectively on his pipe with his seasoned crew on either side of him. One crew were all NCOs, led by Sergeant Sowell. Finally, there were the two Australian aircraft captains, Flying Officer Rossi Ross, who had recently been awarded a DFC, and Flight Lieutenant Mull Mulligan. As usual, they sat together, chatting and kidding around with their men. Forty-eight men, whose average age was only twenty-two, but who looked far older and much more experienced. For they were nearly all of them grizzled veterans, after dozens of sorties over Germany, France, Denmark and Norway. 
they had all proven themselves highly efficient instruments of war, and now, though exhausted by the pace of operation since the new year, they assemble for yet another briefing, yet another mission, and yet another dance with death. When Group Captain Wormsley entered, everyone stood up as normal, until told to resume their seats. The squadron commanders, Gillen and Sisson, and a host of base officers led by Frosty Frost, the intelligence officer, followed Wormsley. They took seats at the side of the stage. Behind Wormsley was a large map on a board, covered with a cloth. A tense hush descended upon the room, as their commander raised a hand to silence his men. Right, chaps, Wormsley announced, hands on his hips. You're probably wondering why you have been asked here this morning. Well, the reason is a jolly simple one. You are the best crews in 49 and 83 squadrons. A burst of nervous laughter and good-natured banter lit up the room before Wormsley silenced them again with a raised hand. But don't let that fact go to your heads. You are all here because of your records on ops. A job has come up that group once seen through, a sort of special mission, and you are the chaps who we've selected to go. Squadron leader Frost here will shortly brief you, but I want you to bear one thing in mind. The operation you will undertake is of great importance at this time, of national importance. Failure is not an option, gentlemen. I expect the utmost effort from you all, and a willingness to push on through to the end. With that, Wormsley left the stage, and Frost stepped up, asking two aircraftmen to remove the cover from the large board behind him, revealing a large-scale map of the two aqueducts, M25 and M25A. There was an audible groan in the room as the pilots and crews recognised the targets. All right, simmer down, Frost said. Now, most of you are familiar with the twin aqueducts near Munster, and some of you have laid on diversions for Hemswell during their recent ops. However, now it's our turn to have a crack at them. Group feels that the reason why previous attacks have failed to destroy these aqueducts was that the crews taking part hadn't been sufficiently trained on these specific targets. So, you'll be very pleased to hear that from this moment on, you can consider yourselves off ops until further notice. A low cheer ran through the room, followed by some animated chatter. But, Frost continued, it doesn't mean that you are grounded. Instead, you are going to be entering a competition of sorts. All twelve crews will make dummy attacks against a target very similar to these aqueducts, and we will score your performances accordingly. You'll be dropping ten-pound smoke bombs in lieu of M-bombs, but accuracy is what we want. You must be able to drop an M-bomb bang on target into an aqueduct the same dimensions from low level and at low speed in the dark. At the end of two weeks, the five crews with the higher scores will form the attacking group for an operation to destroy the aqueducts. The remaining seven crews will act as a diversionary force. Any questions? Uh, yes, sir. Jamie Pitcairn Hill said, sitting in the front row. Where will this training take place? I'm afraid you won't be off on your holidays just yet, Frost replied. Actually, you'll be bombing a target up on a canal near Gainsborough. This was a few miles north of Scampton in Lincolnshire. After fielding a few other questions from the audience, Frost returned to the core of his presentation. Remember, gentlemen, above everything else is accuracy. It is the one thing that we require, Frost said forcefully. And, of course, it goes without saying, you'll need guts, he added with a mischievous smile. Everyone laughed nervously, but it was obvious that this sort of raid was going to be a fairly risky proposition, and that the Germans would not just let them fly in and smash up these vital pieces of infrastructure without making every effort to stop them. The diversion from operations against Germany was a welcome respite for the weary crews, but if they thought it would be a break, they were sorely mistaken. The pace of training was relentless, and every night the selected twelve crews took off from Scampton and headed northwest towards the canal system near the market town of Gainsborough, which included several aqueducts of similar dimensions to those on the Dortmund Ems Canal. Another innovation to aid the crews in familiarising themselves with both aqueducts was a large model that was constructed by the intelligence personnel. This plasticine mock-up was accurate in scaled-down dimensions and showed the two aqueducts, the sections of canal for several thousand yards on each side. 
This enabled the pilots and navigators to plot the best line of final approach to the target. The staff at Scampton created a sort of ad hoc bombing range, where a section of the Chesterfield Canal near Gainsborough was closed to traffic for the two-week duration of training. To make sure that the crews had an aiming point, a large light was fixed to a floating pontoon mid-channel, the same technique previously used for testing the M-bomb at Skipsey. The light represented the dead centre of the aqueduct, and the crews were scored on their ability to land bombs as close as possible to this light. As squadron leader Frost had mentioned, the weapon of choice for the training sorties was the 10-pound tetrachloride smoke bomb, enabling the range officers to accurately assess where the weapons were falling in relation to the target. As with the real thing, so during training the crews would acquire the canal visually, dive down low, and then follow the silvery thread of water towards the target. The only things the range officers couldn't simulate was the blizzard of anti-aircraft fire the Hamdens would be subjected to as they closed on the target, and the blinding white dazzle of large searchlights probing for victims but all of the crews had already experienced both on many occasions, and neither held any great fascination for these hardened flyers. Along the banks of the canal, within the target area, were observers from Scampton. These range officers were there to carefully record each bomb dropped. It would prove to be a hazardous job, as the crews of the Hamdens, even under ideal and benign conditions, could miss their target. On one such mission, Babe Leroyd completely missed the target area and bombed a private boat on the River Trent, fortunately only with a harmless smoke bomb. Precision bombing to this degree was unheard of, and required great skill from both the pilot, who had to fly straight, level and extremely slowly, and the navigator bomb aimer, who had to make a split-second decision to drop as the target came up extremely quickly at such a low altitude. Before one sortie, Guy Gibson had swapped aircraft with Alan Mulligan. Gibson had swung in for his bomb run a few miles back, followed the canal and deposited his smoke bomb a few yards from the moored light before returning to Scampton. Mulligan, by contrast, had made the same approach but had been slightly off target. Later at lunch, an irate base officer had marched over to Gibson's table and told him that he had dropped his bomb on the canal bank in the process nearly blowing the man's foot off. Gibson never got the chance to explain that it had actually been Mulligan at the controls of the offending Hamden. As the dozen crews bombed the floating light night after night, it became clear that the mission that five of the crews would eventually be selected to undertake was something different. If any of them felt qualms about it, they seemed to have kept them to themselves. Britain was fighting for her very existence, and any measure that might avert disaster was worth trying. Joe Collier would call the raid a desperately dangerous, almost suicidal action, which would prove to be a very accurate assessment. Attacking a floating light with a smoke bomb from a hundred feet at virtually stalling speed was difficult enough, but doing the same thing with the thunder of enemy flak all around the aircraft, and searchlights blinding the pilot and navigator was quite another. It was obvious that the chances of reaching the target intact were fairly slim, and of bombing it accurately under such hellish conditions even slimmer. But, despite this terrible harbinger, the crews bravely soldiered on with their training, determined to prove themselves worthy of this important assignment. While the Scampton boys slept all day and bombed all night in preparation for the raid against the aqueducts, along the south coasts of England, the home guard and coastal gun crews stared out to sea and waited. An invasion alert was posted for the period 5th to the 9th of August. All forces were placed on high alert. The sea state was perfect. It was a clear window of opportunity for the Germans, and the British were taking no chances. Through each beautiful summer's day and warm balmy night, the watchers kept up their vigil, the radar stations scanned the air, and the government in Whitehall held its breath. Then, mercifully, on the 10th of August, the weather window, as predicted by the Met Office, closed, and the sea grew rough, and the skies cloudy and overcast. The Germans had not come, this time. The meteorologists consulted their charts and tables, 
the next weather window was scheduled for the 2nd to the 7th of September. Across the Channel, the Germans worked at a feverish pace, gathering troops and masses of equipment in the invasion ports where the yards busily converted hundreds of barges into makeshift landing craft. Hundreds more barges continued to make their way along the Dortmund-Ems Canal towards the coast, the great movement of an army bent on invasion almost irresistible. While the dozen Scampton crews practised and practised, PDU Spitfires flew almost daily missions over the ports. The photographs they took were alarming. Rows upon rows of barges, ready and waiting. The rest of Five Group dutifully bombed these concentrations of enemy shipping every night, but they were mere pinpricks against the elephantine German enterprise. Unknown to the British, the first stage in the invasion of Britain was about to begin, the gaining of aerial superiority. The Germans had codenamed this plan Adler Angriff, or Eagle Attack. The first mass aerial assault on the UK was scheduled for the 12th of August, the same day that the RAF's operation to knock down the Dortmund-Ems Canal was due to be launched. It would be a softening-up action designed to damage RAF fighter airfields. South of London and knock out Britain's chain of radar stations. The next day, 13th of August, was to be Adler Tag, or Eagle Day. On this day, the Germans would destroy RAF Fighter Command in an onslaught so massive that the way would be clear for the seaborne invasion to commence. Unbeknown to Bomber Harris at Five Group or the Scampton Boys, the operation to destroy the aqueducts was to be launched at the critical moment in the German plan to render Britain militarily impotent and open to invasion. The success or failure of the dozen brave young crews had the potential to alter the course of British history for better or worse. Fighter Command would stand bravely and resolutely against the German bombers, but could do nothing about the continued build-up of barges in the Channel ports. Only Bomber Command could make a difference. If those aqueducts could be destroyed, the disruption caused could be sufficient to change Hitler's invasion timetable. He only had a few clear weather windows left before winter closed down any chances of crossing the Channel in 1940. On the 11th of August, the training programme was terminated. The Air Ministry and Bomber Command could not afford any further delays. The 12 crews assembled once more in the big briefing room at Scampton at 3pm. The time had come to select the five crews who would attack the aqueducts. A nervous hush descended on the hall as Group Captain Wormsley strode once more onto the stage before them. You have been listening to The Bridge Busters, The First Dam Busters and The Race to Save Britain, written by Mark Felton, published by Mandalay Books, and narrated by Mark Felton. For videos on a wide variety of military history subjects, please visit my YouTube channel, Mark Felton Productions. You can also help support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon. Details in the description box below. 